I'm James Dudarian, Director of the Center for International Security Studies here at the University of Sydney. And I welcome you all to this very special event. I'm going to be introducing our speaker, Ron Diebert, Professor of Political Science at the University of Toronto and the Director of Citizen Lab, and also our commentator, Aim Sing Peng, who's an expert on social media in Southeast Asia and civil society and state relations. She's going to be offering some comments after Ron's talk. And then we're going to hear from you and questions and hopefully good, sharp answers. Before we begin, though, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which we meet and pay my respect to the Cadigal people of the Eora Nation. I want to also say a word or two about the Global Forum, which is the future insecurity theme of the year. Many people live in precarious times, but it seems ours particularly so, and um, it's partially because we thought there's going to be a better life with interconnectivity, and instead we have this nightmare instead of the dream of cyber balkanization. We also have experienced most recently divisive politics and elections and all kinds of digital machinations that Ron's going to be talking about in a minute. And we're doing this in collaboration with Sydney Ideas because we believe in outreach to the public, but we're also working with the New York Times in Australia and others to try to get the word out because we really are trying to understand what it means with all these different groups that have been either using, abusing, or victims of digital media and digital interconnectivity. And I include here industry, media, governments, some civic action groups, and of course, intelligence networks. What are the implications for our specialty at the center? Geopolitics for how nations behave towards each other and what are the repercussions? Now, this forum is somewhat different than other events you might have attended. We really do model ourselves on two great Australian scholars. The first was the political philosopher, John Anderson, who taught here for close to 30 years, had a great impact on many students. And he taught under the rubric, and I quote here, the Socratic education begins with the awakening of the mind to meet the need for criticism, to the uncertainty of the principles by which it supposed itself to be guided. That skepticism, I think, we need to bring to bear to a period of where we hear all too often about uh, manipulation of the truth. But one of uh, Anderson's most famous students was my mentor, Hedley Bull, the Australian. And he wrote, inquiry has its own morality and is necessarily subversive of political institutions and movements of all kinds, good as well as bad. Now, we wish to start there, but take the global forum one step further and look at some positive alternatives to the destructive cyber conflicts and geopolitics of the day. We're coming, um, as you can see from the advertisements, we have several forums um, coming up, including David Sanger, the national security correspondent for the New York Times, uh, Calypso Nicolaides, who's the director of the Center for International uh, Studies at Oxford University, Chris Demchek from the US Naval War College, and others. So if you can attend these events, we believe in getting the word out as many multiple media as possible. It will be available, edited, online. Um, so um, there'll be multiple ways. And Sky News is here as well recording. So I want to thank them for helping us in our outreach. Now, interesting enough, we originally intended to hold this event in the philosophy lecture hall where John Anderson held his lectures. It's just not big enough. We're really um, pleased by the reception to Ron's uh, talk. And part of the reason why is because Ron has a reputation, a global reputation. And I want to introduce him by something he just reminded me of at our reception today, that our relationship goes back many years. And it began with a letter. To, to show you how you know, long ago this relationship began, it wasn't with an email. It was a letter that came through the post. And it was an invitation. It was an invitation to a conference on surveillance. And when I received this invitation, I think there was maybe a handful of people doing this kind of work in international relations, and, and of course, Michel Foucault, but that was about it. And so um, I went. It was at the University of British Columbia. And lo and behold, uh, this fellow who organized this incredible event, one of the best I've experienced then and many years later, 
was a postgraduate doctoral student. Since then, he's gone on to many great accomplishments. I'm not going to belabor them all, but I'm going to just highlight that besides being the founder and director of the remarkable Citizen Lab in Toronto, um, he's been the founder and principal uh, investigator of the OpenNet Initiative. He was a founder of the startup Siphon, one of the world's, I think, first software internet programs for protecting citizens, particularly in civil societies. He's the author of several books, most recently Black Code, Surveillance, Privacy, and the Dark Side of the Internet. Many, many chapters and articles and reports on internet censorship, surveillance, and security. The reports of Citizen Lab have had a true impact, and one judge of that impact is by who his new enemies are. Um, Ron will probably talk about this, but we recently have been reading in the news, AP, New York Times, and just today uh, a video came out about efforts to thwart the good works of Citizen Lab to sniff out repression and worse crimes that are happening over the internet. I think Ron will be talking about that, so I'll not belabor it. But he's um, in recognition of his good works, he's been awarded the Electronic Frontier Foundation Pioneer Award, the Neil Postman Award for Career Achievement, the Advancement of Intellectual Freedom in Canada, many others, but I'm going to focus on just one and will probably offend some Republicans in this room, but he's also the recipient of the Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Medal. So these are great accomplishments, and um, I think he uh, has fully earned this recognition. So please uh, join me in a warm welcome for uh, Ron Diebert. Thank you very much. Thanks, James. Appreciate it. Oh, thank you, everybody, uh, for coming here tonight. Wow, it's a big audience. Thank you, James, for the introduction. It's uh, been one of the amazing things of my professional career from the moment that letter was written to be a colleague of yours, and I really admire what you're doing. So it's great to come visit you here at, at the University of Sydney. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you all for coming. So I'm, ju I'm just curious, how many people have heard of the Citizen Lab before? OK, so quite a few. That's great. As James mentioned, I'm director of the Citizen Lab. I founded it more than 15 years ago. The Citizen Lab does research on digital security issues, and that's a very big field today. If you want to use the term cybersecurity, uh, that's fine too. Almost every day there's another item in the news about some issue, data breach, or whatever. We don't cover the entire terrain. Instead, we focus on digital security issues that arise out of human rights concerns. So we're interested in threats to free expression, to privacy, how uh, digital security issues affect human rights organizations, how they affect the practice of journalism. So basically, the core issues around democracy and human rights are what drive and focus our, the research that we do at the Citizen Lab. The signature of the Citizen Lab is our mixture of methods. So as James mentioned, I'm a uh, political scientist, an international relations person by training. But most of the people who work at the Citizen Lab come from different disciplines and backgrounds. And one of our strengths is to integrate all of these different methods and specializations into the work that we do. You often hear in universities this idea of interdisciplinarity. Um, I think the Citizen Lab, it's fair to say, is one of the few places where you actually see that being practiced. So we actually integrate the methods, especially of computer science and engineering science, into the work that we do. Um, we're not an activist or advocacy group. Instead, we see ourselves uh, putting forward very careful evidence-based uh, research into the public domain. Uh, we see ourselves as lifting the lid on what's going on beneath the surface uh, of the internet and exposing wrongdoings, bringing them to the public's attention in the hopes that others will pick that up and do whatever advocacy is needed or activism is, is uh, they feel is necessary. But our research is, if you read a typical Citizen Lab report, very clinical, very measured. Uh, we see ourselves producing peer-reviewed, reproducible research in the public interest. Uh, we've been described as a kind of counterintelligence for civil society. 
uh, or a CSI of human rights, if you watch that show. I don't watch that show myself, but I, uh, I can understand why people describe us that way. And I hope in the course of describing some of the cases that I do here, you get a sense of why people use that description. Uh, I think it's an important function that universities, university-based research organizations maybe have gotten away from. And I feel pretty strongly that uh, with the threats that are going on in the world today around some basic uh, human rights, basic principles that are core to academic freedom, universities must be a place where you have this type of protected space where risky, controversial research in the public interest can, can take place. The thesis of my talk, if you will, there, uh, there, there is a core argument I think I'm, I'm going to present here is that there is a real crisis of democracy happening today. And the talk that I'm going to give is focus on one area of research of ours. It's really, I think, one of the, the uh, main ones for us as a group is what we call targeted digital espionage. You read about cyber espionage in the news probably all the time. Uh, there are uh, episodes of hacks into corporations and governments. Those are important issues. Uh, but what we see at the Citizen Lab is that those type of targeted attacks happening against not only ordinary citizens, but human rights organizations, humanitarian organizations, journalists, all that we would include in the category of civil society. And in my view, looking at over the last 10 years of doing this research, it's really become an epidemic, a kind of silent epidemic to the extent that we're now uh, facing a kind of crisis of democracy because of the scope and scale of what's going on around uh, the type of things that we're unearthing. So what I'm going to do is run through some cases uh, from recent Citizen Lab research, and then I'll widen out at the end and, and uh, talk about uh, some of the larger implications of what we're finding. And then I'd love to have a discussion with you and with AIM as well about um, uh, some of the uh, topics that I that I bring up here. So let me begin first. Uh, in the area of targeted digital espionage, typically we begin with what we call a patient zero. And this is uh, definitely one of them. This person is named Ahmad Mansour. He's a award-winning human rights uh, defender in the United Arab Emirates. And back in August 2016, Ahmad received these two text messages on his iPhone. And instead of clicking on the links, he forwarded them to us at Citizen Lab for analysis. And one of the researchers at the Citizen Lab took one look at the screenshot of the text message, and based purely on the domains in the text message, he recognized immediately that he was dealing with a live targeted attack against a human rights defender involving a company's spyware that we had been tracking. And that company was NSO Group. So NSO Group is an, an Israeli self-described cyber warfare company. Now, um, this is not the type of company that likes publicity. They typically avoid the spotlight. Until recently, if you Googled NSO Group, virtually no nothing would show up. In fact, most of what you see now, if you Google NSO Group, relates to Citizen Lab research about, about NSO Group. And as James said, if you, if you did it today, you'd see that they're implicated in what appears to be an attempt to infiltrate uh, clandestinely my lab at the University of Toronto, uh, possibly through uh, an operation involving an Israeli private intelligence company called Black Cube. So these type of companies, they sell to governments, to law enforcement, to military capabilities that enable them to engage effect effectively in information warfare, in state-based hacking, if you will. It's a very lucrative market, but it's one they don't like to publicize. They typically sell their, their products and services in the equivalent of military trade shows. Now, when they do speak to the media, they make two claims. We only sell to governments, and we follow Israeli and local laws. Both of those are entirely true, accurate. They're also precisely part of the problem that I think we need to address in this area, because there's a gap here, 
And as you'll see, there's a lot of abuse coming from this marketplace that we're unearthing that's causing significant harm. So had Ahmad Mansour clicked on those links, his iPhone would have been silently exploited uh, and taken over by the operators of this Israeli spyware, which in his case would have been the intelligence agencies of the United Arab Emirates. That's very difficult to do. Uh, some of you may know that uh, Apple products are among the most secure out there. And typically, if you want to go out and purchase a known software flaw in an Apple product to be able to exploit the, the device, on the gray market, that typically runs around a million dollars or more. This particular attack on Aman Mansour's iPhone involved three separate, what were called zero days, uh, basically these uh, software flaws. So it was a very expensive attack that the UAE was using against this particular human rights defender. Now, had he clicked on those links, as I said, they would have silently taken over his device and be able to see effectively everything that was going on in his device. That means they would have been able to read and intercept all of his emails and text messages, even those that were end-to-end -end encrypted. They would have been able to change the security settings on the device uh, without his knowledge. They would have been able to activate the microphone and the camera, effectively turning that device into a silent wiretap, capturing ambient uh, sound in a room, so eavesdropping on whatever conversations are going on. And most importantly, they would have been able to track all of his movements because it is able to uh, tap into the geolocation of the device. So this is very, very powerful technology. I'm assuming everybody in this room has a mobile device in their pocket. So you can imagine how tempting and how valuable it is for intelligence agencies or other uh, bad actors to be able to get access to, to your device without you knowing about it. Once they're able to access your, the, your device, they can see virtually everything that you're doing and also spoof uh, your communications as well. So in other words, send messages without you knowing to your contacts claiming that you're, that you're doing something or have them click on some other type of attachment that perhaps has malware in it, thus affecting your social network. So when we discovered what we were dealing with, we actually, Bill Marzak, the lead researcher, borrowed an iPhone from a friend, reset it, infected it, and realized that he was dealing with you know, this very mil military-grade uh, surveillance technology. We realized we had a ethical responsibility to disclose this to Apple. I mean, we could have, if we were unethical, we could have cashed in and retired and bought an island somewhere, but that's not what we do. So instead, we notified Apple. And remarkably, we received the text messages on August 11th, 2016. And our report came out, I think it was August 26th or 25th. Um, and it was co-timed with a patch for all iOS, OS X, and Safari products. Basically, all Apple products. It affected more than a billion people, the security patch worldwide. So that was a pretty, you know, it was very fast. Apple worked like overnight to get this patch out there. And for us as researchers, this is a pretty big accomplishment for our group. You know, when you, when you have uh, foundations that fund your research, they always ask, you know, what is the big impact of your research? Well, we can live off this one for a long time. It affected more than about a billion people. So some of you may have asked yourselves, how is it that Aman Mansour, this guy in the UAE, knew about these Canadian researchers and instead of clicking on the links, forwarded, forwarded them to us for analysis? Well, the reason is we'd actually done uh, two separate reports with Ahmad Mansour as the target. And in each case, uh, he was targeted by his own government using a different commercial spyware product. So back in 2011, he received an email, he forwarded it to us. That was the first one we did. And at that time, they were using the technology of a British company, or maybe it was a German or Swiss company, they kind of move around, called Finfisher. And then a year later, an Italian company, Milan-based hacking team, and then finally, uh, NSO Group. So you think about the expenses 
the resources that the government is willing to go to just to get inside the iPhone and the devices of a single human rights defender. I mean, this, this technology is being sold to these government agencies under the rubric of fighting crime and terrorism. And here it's being used to get inside this human rights defender's iPhone. Unbelievable. So there's a bit of a sad coda to this story. Ahmad Mansour is presently in jail. He was, I guess they finally gave up. You know, we can't get inside your device, so we're just going to arrest you. And he was sentenced to 10 years in prison for insulting the regime. I kid you not. So at the time that we were doing uh, that particular investigation, we were simultaneously scanning the internet, looking for evidence of these shortened links that we knew were connected to NSO Group's infrastructure. And we found that earlier, people were tweeting, saying, hey, I received a funny text message. Doesn't look right to me. Did anyone else receive it? And this was one case that stood out for us as a Mexican investigative journalist who did precisely that. He happened to be covering a scandal in Mexico involving the president and the first lady and some kind of Chinese investment in Mexico related to the building of a, of a mansion. And so he, he, you know, he was doggedly reporting, following leads here. So we realized, hmm, this is pretty interesting because when we looked at this, we knew those shortened links, the bit.ly links, were connected to NSO Group's infrastructure. So there was some kind of targeting going on in Mexico. And what we do at Citizen Lab, when we want to focus in on a particular country, we try to find partners that we can work with that know the local situation, that can keep their eye out for something that would be useful for us to investigate. And this was one of our partners, Luis Fernando Garcia, uh, with an organization called R3D. And we said, Luis, check with your networks of contacts and Make sure you ask, has anyone received any suspicious text messages? If you find out about it, let us know. Sure enough, within a couple of weeks, Louis said, Citizen Lab, I think I have some targets. The first set of targets in Mexico were really quite shocking, I have to say. It turned out that there are a group of health scientists and research advocates in Mexico who were campaigning to put a tax on the consumption of sugary beverages. In Mexico, there's actually a, a pretty bad obesity problem that people have connected to the consumption of sugary beverages. So these health scientists have been advocating for this. Obviously, there's a big industry around beverage industry in Mexico, Coca-Cola, et cetera, that would be very much against that. And they're probably tied in with uh, certain Mexican government officials. These health scientists and advocates all received uh, suspicious text, text messages. And here is one. The, people often say, you know, I'm pretty alert to these type of things. I wouldn't click on a funny email from a Nigerian prince or whatever. Take a look at this one and ask yourself, would you click on this? Especially those of you that, who have children. This person received this text message saying, Mr. Simon, your daughter, and we redacted her name, but they used her actual name, has been in a serious car accident. Here are the details. You might be tempted to click on that link. The next set of targets were journalists. This is Carmen Aristegui. She's a very prominent journalist in Mexico. She was doing investigative reporting on corruption around the president's office. She was targeted relentlessly with text messages that we connected to this uh, Israeli company. But they didn't stop with Carmen. When, they, when she didn't click on any of the links and they couldn't get inside their device, believe it or not, they started targeting her minor child who was going to boarding school in the United States. His name is Emilio. And Emilio received this text message. So imagine being in a foreign country, 18 years old, and you get a text message saying, this is the US Embassy, there's a problem with your visa, you must uh, go now. So somebody in Mexico was using Israeli spyware to try to get at Carmen by going after a minor child in the United States. As far as I know, that violates at least U two US federal statutes, maybe three. It's a pretty big, uh, serious crime. And then the last one in this set of Mexican cases was uh, 
quite shocking, actually. This is a murder journalist, uh, Mr. Cardenas, who had been investigating cartel uh, issues in Mexico. He was gunned down in the streets. The day after uh, he was murdered, his two colleagues at the news organization received these texts purporting to show evidence of uh, connection to the murders. It's interesting because in the, if you've been following the trial of El Chapo, details have emerged that uh, El Chapo reportedly gave $100 million to the president of Mexico. That's uh, what's seen in Mexico as uh, terrorism, crime, right? We're going to use this technology to get at investigative journalists covering the drug cartel. So in Mexico, over the course of 2017 and into 2018, we discovered more than 24 cases of civil society groups being targeted with sophisticated Israeli spyware by presumably Mexican government officials, from media to lawyers, public health advocates, anti-corruption advocates, even, quite shockingly, international investigators who were investigating this horrible mass disappearance in Mexico, coming from four separate countries into Mexico with diplomatic immunity, all of their phones were targeted with NSO group technology. More than 24 so far, and I say so far because we're still working with Luis and his team, going back in time, looking at people who read about the reports, and I should say, <clears throat> over the course of 2017, this research was featured four separate times on the front pages of the New York Times. So it's gotten a lot of publicity and that's also a pretty good, uh, remarkable achievement for our group. The publicity helps because people read about it and then new targeting surfaces that we can investigate. Another part of our research in this area is takes a kind of different starting point. So, as I mentioned, we often start with a patient zero, someone like Ahmad Mansour, and we work out from there. But we also use pretty interesting network scanning techniques. So once we get a copy of the malicious software that's at the heart of the spyware, our researchers will reverse engineer it, infect our own computers, and then look carefully at how it communicates. So this type of surveillance technology to work, it has to infect a phone but then communicate somewhere, right? So to listen in on your device information, data has to go to the company's infrastructure. And that type of communication leaves a digital trace that if you know where and how to look, you can discover it. So what we do is we literally scan the internet 24 hours a day, seven days a week, connecting to every single internet connected device on the internet which is billions of devices, looking for the unique signatures that we associate with how the command and control infrastructure of these different spyware systems operate. It's, it's quite remarkable research, takes a lot of time, but it bears some interesting fruit. So what we're able to do using these methods is start to uh, isolate who are the country clients of some of these spyware companies. And it's actually a pretty disturbing picture. So the first time we did this was back in 2014 with this Italian company hacking team. And when we isolated who the country clients were, remember what the, the NSO group said, we only sell to governments. Yeah, but these are governments that have a very poor track record around human rights and the rule of law. And they're likely to use this very powerfully invasive technology against civil society. We did the same thing a year later with the British, German, Swiss company, Finn Fisher, an even more disturbing picture. This is a really interesting case. So here is a, yet another company. This is yet another Israeli company called Cyberbit. And in this case, what we were able to do is they made a mistake in the setup of their command and control infrastructure that allowed us to see a directory where all of the infected devices they were monitoring were checking in. So we could see uh, where, in this case, Ethiopia, which was the country client, who they were spying on. Now, we couldn't see exactly who the individuals were, but we could tell what countries they were coming from. 
Now, what's remarkable about this, a couple of things. Ethiopia is running a global cyber espionage campaign. I mean, Ethiopia, for those of you who don't know, internet penetration of 1.1%. It is one of the poorest countries in the world. And yet, thanks to this industry, they are able to effectively purchase their own national security agency off the shelf, right? This is like Five Eyes technology for sale. So Ethiopia can mount a global cyber espionage operation. There was another really cool part of this particular report. So as I said, we were able to take advantage of mistakes that they made and see all the devices that were checking in that were infected. Well, among those infected devices was a laptop that employees of this company were using to give demonstrations to potential clients. We could tell it was different than the other ones. And what we were able to do is actually follow them as they traveled the world, demonstrating their product to prospective clients, right? So look at this timeline here. These employees of Cyberbit, they travel to Tashkent, Uzbekistan, and what do they do? You know, those of you who do business trips, you get to your hotel room, you check in. Late at night, you're going to check your presentation, make sure it's working, put it to sleep. Next morning, you're going to get up, you're going to go to the Uzbek Secret Services and give a demonstration. We could see this. We could actually tell they were checking in from the Radisson. It was amazing. And then, based on that, we could also see who the other clients were. And I'll take a look at this picture. Zambia, Rwanda, Thailand, eh, that's for you. Uzbekistan, Vietnam, Kazakhstan, Serbia, Czech Republic, Nigeria, France, okay, but these other countries, not such good track records around human rights abuses. And look at this one over here, the office of the president of the Philippines. This is a guy who's basically openly advocating for the murder of journalists, right? These are, these are clients that are almost certainly going to abuse this technology. Most recent one of these scans we did for NSO Group, the company that I started the presentation with. And what we found here, again, very disturbing picture. In this case, we could see infected devices checking into more than 40 countries. So there were operations of, I think, 30 government agencies we could isolate that were undertaking surveillance in more than 40 countries. And one of them really stood out for us. This is an operator that we inferred was Saudi Arabia. We gave it the code name Kingdom. And what we could see here is a Saudi espionage operation involving NSO group targeting individuals in a bunch of countries. Now, one country stood out for us because we're Canadian, Canada. And we thought, hmm, I wonder who Saudi Arabia is spying on in Canada. Now, it's interesting, the timing around this was during the summer. Uh, in Canada, so around July, August. And this was right in the midst of a major diplomatic dispute between Canada and Saudi Arabia. Our foreign affairs minister had criticized Saudi Arabia for their human rights record and the treatment of women. And so there was a huge diplomatic dispute. So we thought this is very timely. We, we got to pursue this. All we could see from our vantage point was that there was an infected device checking in from two di different internet service providers at different times of the day. But they were both coming from the Montreal, Quebec region. So um, we started reaching out to the Saudi diaspora community in Quebec and saying, you know, who might be a likely target of Saudi surveillance in Quebec? And lo and behold, we came across this guy, Omar Abdul Aziz. He's a Saudi dissident, a Canadian permanent resident. He uh, came to Canada and sought asylum in 2014. And Omar runs a very popular YouTube channel that's watched by literally uh, millions of people. He has a huge following. Basically, it's like the, I don't know if you know this show in Australia, the Colbert Report. Like it's kind of like the Colbert Report of the Gulf region. Like he mocks Mohammed bin Salman and the other Saudi elites. He's a very funny guy, very animated guy. So we got his contact information. We emailed him, explained who we were. He actually knew of Citizen Lab because of the reporting that we had done 
he was a little suspicious and guarded, but we said, okay, we'll meet you in a coffee shop. And we said, tell us, Omar, what do you do? What did you do on this day, this time of day, and so on? So it turned out a couple of interesting things. First of all, when we checked through his text messages, it turned out he had received uh, this SMS message. And again, as soon as we saw that domain, we knew this was connected to NSO group. So on that basis alone, we had confirmation he was targeted. On this very day, he had ordered protein powder off of Amazon. He likes to go to the gym and lift weights. And so uh, a few hours later, he got this text message, thought it was related to his purchase of the protein powder, and he clicked on the link. Then when we asked him about his habits, turns out that Omar lived in Sherbrooke, Quebec, but every evening, methodically, he would go to the gym at Bishop's University. That matched exactly the check-ins we could see. So remarkably, we were all just like dumbfounded. We found the target of the Saudi espionage. Incredible. Now, there's, a, there's an interesting unexpected development to this story. Let's put it that way. So our report was published October 1st, 2016. October 2nd, I get a text message from Omar saying, I'm very upset. Jamal Khashoggi is missing. I'm like, Jamal Khashoggi, the journalist? What? Like, I, I didn't even hear about this yet in the news. What's that got to do with you? Well, it turned out that Jamal Khashoggi, the person that you all know about, and Omar Abdul Aziz, the person that we discovered, had been for many, many weeks and months scheming together, plotting together social media activism against the Saudi regime. And needless to say, their private conversations, or let me correct myself, what they assumed were private conversations, were very, very sensitive. Omar and Khashoggi were talking about creating a social media army. They called it the bees that they, they would organize. Khashoggi transferred money to Omar Abdul Aziz. And certainly the surveillance that we uh, uncovered and connected to Omar likely played a role in the decision to eliminate Khashoggi. Now, so far I've been talking about uh, this very high-tech commercial surveillance technology, which is a big, big problem. But I want to underline that the research that we undertake at the Citizen Lab comes across many other types of espionage that have nothing to do with this very fancy technology. Let's call it espionage on the cheap. And it's very effective. Um, you don't need to purchase million dollar software to accomplish the same things in many cases. I'll give you a couple examples. So in Egypt, we wrote a report about this targeted espionage campaign. There was a very prominent human rights lawyer who was arrested. And within two hours, about a dozen of her associates received this message, which purports to be a Dropbox link, but is fake. And it says that it has details about her arrest warrant. And so, of course, her associates might be tempted to click on that link. If they did, they would come to this. Looks legit, but it's not. Many of them enter in their credentials. Once they do, their computers are completely owned. There's even a better case. Even if you have a lot of resources and you're a great power, you might not use very sophisticated technology. The best example of this comes from perhaps the greatest hack of the last 20 years, right? So um, we all know the story, or, or maybe it's worth refreshing. Putin uh, went to his uh, underlings at the security services who in turn contracted out to organized criminal groups who uh, said, OK, let's get on it. Who do we want to target? And you don't need much, maybe some Photoshop expertise. You put together something like this, looks legit. Many of you might receive something like this, a security warning. One person who did was John Podesta, right? So John Podesta, he's sitting in his White House meeting, gets a text message. Uh-oh, what do I do? And the, the story, the apocryphal story, is he contacted his security person who said, that message is legitimate. 
And later on he said, oops, I meant to say illegitimate. I don't know, that doesn't sound right to me. In any event, it doesn't matter. He clicked, entered it in his credentials, and the rest is history, right? History would have been completely different had John Podesta had two-factor authentication, but he didn't. Now, we had another patient zero at precisely this time that was a subject of a Citizen Lab report. This person is named David Satter, very prominent uh, journalist, expert in Russian affairs. Uh, he wrote many books, uh, particularly this one, Darkness at Dawn, which laid out the evidence that Putin's rise to power was facilitated by an engineered uh, domestic bombing in Moscow that the KGB had something to do with. And for that, he was expelled from Russia. So right at the same time Podesta was getting those emails, David Satter uh, got one as well. And we know David because his son, Raphael Satter, happens to be the chief cybersecurity correspondent at Associated Press. And he's done many reports on Citizen Lab. So as soon as his father received this, he said, hey, Citizen Lab, I think my father's being targeted. Looks suspicious, can you take a look? So unfortunately, uh, David entered in his credentials, much like John Podesta. And what they did is vacuumed up all the documents in his, in his emails and then released them in the public domain, but doctored them to make it appear as if David Satter was not really a journalist. He was a CIA agent who was uh, supporting financially Alexei Navalny, prominent Russian uh, critic and opposition figure. Now, in the course of doing this research, one of our researchers, um, in, in ways that I, I won't begin to explain here because even I, honestly, I don't think I can fully understand this, but he, he was able to unravel the shortened link that was sent to David Satter and identify more than 200 targets by name who were also part of this Russian espionage campaign. And so we had for a brief window insight into who those Russian operators were targeting. And many of the targets, very high level, what you'd probably expect, right? Like there's some pretty serious uh, high-level people here. And there are people in military and industry. But what stood out for us and, and really underlines the case that I'm making here was there a very large proportion of targets were civil society. When we quantified it, civil society is the second largest target group, which makes sense when you think about it from the perspective of an autocrat like Putin. And I think this kind of challenges some of the conventional ways, especially people who are trained in international relations, think about what the threat model is for authoritarian regimes. Most of us think, well, there's you know, a geopolitical battle going on, Russia versus United States, China, etc. But from the perspective of an autocrat or a kleptocrat like Putin, civil society represents a major threat. These are the human rights organizations that are investigating you, the opposition figures, the journalists that are exposing your wrongdoing. For you, they represent as big a threat as, uh, as other governments and militaries. So when Putin says, who's watching my enemies, one half of the security services says, don't worry, I've got the Clintons, the DNC, but then another half says, I've got the NGOs. And that certainly represents the targeting uh, that we see at Citizen Lab. So I'd just like to step back in the last couple of minutes that I have and talk about the larger context around this and why I'm so concerned about what it is that we're seeing. So first of all, there is a general trend um, that's being recognized now. I think we live in a time when authoritarianism is resurgent. This picture which was, I think, a few, maybe a couple weeks after the murder of Khashoggi, really underlines the deterioration of norms internationally. The fact that these two could get together, high-five each other, and kind of laugh about the whole affair is symptomatic of the, the deteriorating state of world politics right now. Authoritarianism is resurgent. There really is a vacuum internationally around any counterweight. And as a consequence, 
these regimes are being empowered. And at the, precisely the same time, we're going through this transformation in digital technology where every one of us has these devices that follow us around, social media accounts where we turn our lives inside out, and there is a huge booming cybersecurity industry. The term cybersecurity sounds kind of banal, like it's very anodyne. But when you look at it closely, these are companies that are putting into the hands of policymakers very powerful technologies that allow them to monitor everything that you're doing. And in the hands of autocrats, that ends up causing significant and growing harm. So this sector, the commercial surveillance technology sector, largely unregulated and highly prone to abuse. And I believe it's actually causing one of the greatest forms of insecurity. Ironically, a new form of insecurity itself is coming from the cybersecurity industry. And if you look at it by sector, the risks are not equally divided. So you hear about these cybersecurity attacks all the time, uh, affecting governments, affecting corporations, data breaches happening, so on. All of that's very serious, and I don't want to minimize it. But the reality is big companies that get targeted by cyber espionage actors, as well as governments, have a lot of resources at their disposal to deal with the problem. They can go out and spend millions of dollars, hire you know, big investigative firms and companies to deal with the threats that they face. Civil society, on the other hand, it's kind of like healthcare in a lot of regions of the global south. Most of these organizations lack capacity. They barely have somebody who can plug in a printer, let alone deal with advanced persistent threats coming from nation state actors. So there's a huge asymmetry in terms of capacity to deal with the problems that we're seeing worldwide, which is why I think we have really here a growing epidemic of problems. Based on the last 10 years of research, what I see is a market failure that's having huge impact in terms of the functioning of civil society. So most of these organizations, they lack basic IT capacity. They don't have the resources to deal with the problem. They don't have policies or security practices in place. If you look at even large, well-endowed human rights organizations, and I won't name any specifically because I don't want to put them on the spot, but most of them really are only beginning to understand that there's a serious digital security threat facing their organization, and yet they don't know how to properly deal with it. Often, digital security threats are not always salient. They're dealing with some kind of humanitarian crisis or a zone of conflict. They're dodging bullets if they're journalists covering war zones, and they don't really think about digital security. Or maybe their basic digital technologies are not up to date because they can't afford software updates or fancy firewalls that are going to protect them from these threats. And yet, the same groups that target industry and government, we now know definitively, this is a fact, are targeting civil society. And where is this all leading? I think it's a crisis of democracy. If civil society is being targeted in this way, we're really talking about a hollowing out of democracy, which is one of the great ironies of the digital age. When I first started this research back at the time I sent the letter to James, conventional wisdom was that the internet, digital technologies would lead to a great flourishing of democracy. And we saw kind of evidence of that during the Arab Spring and other moments. But what we're now seeing is actually the opposite. It's leading to a crisis of democracy and that, at least, is my um, big concern that I hope to persuade you of here uh, today. So thank you for indulging me, and I look forward to our conversation. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to hear from AIM in a minute, but I just found this on my seat, so I think I'm going to endorse this, another report. This one's by uh, a group that AIM co-founded with Frank Smith, who's with us today. Um, here on cybersecurity. 
Um, you can get copies. If this didn't scare the bejesus out of you, I'm sure this will as well. <laughs> um, so there's some copies up on yes, top. Yes, just by the exit door. Okay, so that's you right feel here. Feel free to grab a copy. So, um, so we can all sleep uh, tonight. Aim's going to try to uh, give us some reassurance that it's not quite as dark as we just saw, but maybe not. Maybe this will be a one-two punch. So AIM is, for those who came in late, is uh, an expert on civil society relations, particularly on how digital media has influenced politics between those two groups, largely in the Southeast Asian area and region, but also beyond. And um, we're delighted to have her here today. So we'll hear from AIM, and then we'll um, open it up to um, all of you. Please, Em. Well, thank you, James and Ron, for this excellent presentation. Um, in so many ways, when I look at that map and I look at countries that are uh, in red colors, it almost doesn't surprise me. Like, I'm not shocked by seeing it. I work almost exclusively on authoritarian countries or countries that have started as a democracy and then are now authoritarian. But what's surprising is the length that they would go just to get at an activist, right? I mean, I remember growing up when you don't like the government, you're dead on the street. I mean, what happened to that, right? In most of these countries, no, I mean. So that's the upside. <laughs> that's the upside. That's the upside. You can sleep at night now. Right. There was a guy, an older guy, so I'm originally from Thailand, as what Ron was pointing, and there was an older guy who had been sent to jail for 70 something years in Thailand for sending an SMS messages threatening the monarchy and the old man was like, when he got arrested, was like, what is an SMS, <laughs> right? So it was clearly a Trump up charge. He, he died in prison. Mm -hmm. um, so what happened to that, right? And, and so why are authoritarian regimes today willing to look much more tech savvy and sophisticated? And that's what um, I'm scratching my head uh, around as well. And so in fact, in those countries that have red flags, if you look at the past statistics of number of journalists being murdered, it's actually gone down, right? Journalists are, are, are now not the deadliest uh, career choice uh, anymore. And I know more this in Southeast Asia and other regions, like for example, Philippines used to be always, you know, you don't want to be a journalist. It's still the most dangerous place to be a journalist in Southeast Asia, but the record number of deaths have definitely gone down. So one of the reasons um, I think why journalists and people who work in civil society are, you know, have a long life expectancies now than they did 20 years ago was because their death is no longer valuable, right? It's more valuable to figure out who they work with, what information they transmitted, what their networks are, than to prove that they're scheming up against the government. I mean, the regime pretty much knows this, so it's much more valuable to them to find out their networks, right? Because the problem with authoritarian regimes is that they have very shallow roots in society. They often come to power illegitimately, so they don't have the feet on the ground and the grassroots support that people who get elected legitimately do. Yeah. So how do they find out information about what their society think, think about? They can't necessarily do it on a poll. They can poll their citizens whether they're popular or not because people might lie, right? So the, then plugging in to society this way, right, has become very valuable to them. And because so many of these civil society organizations are increasingly reliant on overseas network for support, money, funding, because they can't get grants from their own government for obvious reason, they really want to find out even more, right? You're right, Ron, that the critical um, pressure on the government is domestic, right? They want to stay in power, it's a domestic issue, but increasing the number of actors that are, that are going to ensure this or harm the regime security is actually overseas. Many of these civil society NGOs have networks of expats everywhere where they get the money, the funding, or in some cases, it's the expat communities that, ha that live in countries with more freedom that actually help to facilitate the functioning of these NGOs at all. So sometimes some of the servers yeah. of these NGOs are run outside the country because it's not safe 
for them to be in the country. So to find out about those networks so that the government can act and have a better information about their own society, but also where these organizations, these individuals are getting their funding or ideas from, has become much more important. And therefore, they're not killing them off anymore because they're no, no good when they're in jail or dead. They're yeah. better off alive, where they can be monitored and surveyed, and more and more information for the regime to collect. So that's, that's something point. that I think would, would explain why. And secondly, um, one aspect of this that Ron hasn't touched on, but I do know that Citizen Lab works on, is the issue of disinformation or issue of manipulation of public opinion, which is another more sophisticated ways that authoritarian governments are actually trying to do and to get a better sense of the, the population is contesting the veracity of information online. And so they are employing other, way, other ways in which they could also manipulate the truth out of, the gov uh, out of their own people. And one of the interesting things I find in my own research is that in Southeast Asian countries where social media usage is the highest in the world, but believe it or not, uh, meaning the people there spend more hours per day on social media than anywhere else on earth, actually have a very high trust of information from social media. So social media is expanding in countries where A, civil society is weak, governments are increasingly autocratic if they're not already autocratic, and there are very few organizations trying to fight for um, citizens' rights, and also dealing with population that have gone from having no phone to having uh, social media apps in split seconds. And they also heavily trust information they see, especially if they're shared by their family members. And so the, and so this is, and and they're trying to target. Uh, the, these governments are trying to target these uh, populations in countries where they don't even have fact-checking initiatives, mm. right? They're coming up with Southeast Asia is actually pioneering anti-fake news legislation. They're coming up with new laws to give themselves the government the ability to tell you what's true and what's not. In countries where there are actually no NGOs to actually find out facts. So they're coming at civil society journalists in a whole bunch of different ways uh, than ever before, just to manage, to control, and to monitor their behaviors. So the risks and the, the, the attacks you're talking about are hitting at them in multiple ways and making them vulnerable, getting at family members, getting at what's true and what's not true. You're starting to doubt yourself, you know, what you're seeing and what you're not seeing. Is it true or not? And I'm starting to wonder if public education is ever going to help, mm. right? I mean, you're, you're saying, well, if you see an, a mysterious link and maybe if you're critical-minded enough or educated enough, you maybe think twice about clicking on it. But on the other hand, if it's related to your family members, you're not. It's the same way with social media. If you're seeing some weird information, you might think, mm, maybe. But if it's shared by your family members, that must be true, isn't it? So we are dealing, we're in a very interesting time. Yeah. People have less time more than ever to think critically because we're too busy. Yeah. The governments are finding out many more ways than ever to monitor us. And... Um, See, she's, We're not, she's writing. <laughs> I can. It's, it's making making us all positive. It's a positive. positive. I, I'm fine. I'm, <laughs> I think I'm going to be able to sleep tonight. Um, That's great. Yeah, yeah. But thank you, Abe, very much. Thank you. So, just one takeaway. I mean, we obviously are indebted to Ron and, and his group and for the remarkable detective work and, and lifting the lid, as you call it. But I think many of us are thinking about what can we do and what can be done besides this type of work that probably has some deterrent effect, I hope, but unlike any other... Maybe it helps publicize for the companies. Well, that's it. Everybody's going to go now and I buy their stock in NSO. Yeah. Um, but the question is, really, I, my question to both of you is um, this is clearly like other arms races in some ways. There's an offense, defense, how do you deter, um, how do you make treaties? But all that sounds kind of archaic. It sounds like the old days, you know, Westphalia, geopolitics. Is it going to be something else that's going to finally get ahead of this race? Um, you know, I'm not asking you to find one solution, but 
other than the model you've just given us, what do both of you think might be the best possible way to um, fight this? I think all the NGOs should have a direct line to your lab. <laughs> <laughs> Help. Help. Need a much bigger lab. <laughs> Can you maybe enfranchise like McDonald's? Well, and with all seriousness, I think um, one of the things that I'm advocating for now is that the model that we have established be duplicated at other universities. It's not rocket science. Um, it's, it's complicated, but it's not rocket science. Furthermore, the, the methods are transparent, peer-reviewed, reproducible. Um, it astonishes me that there are not more citizen labs at universities worldwide, because if you did have 30 or 40 um, around the world, it would, it would act as, a, I think, a pretty big deterrent. Um, and there would be a lot more exposition of things going on um, in ways that we just can't keep up with. There, there's, we, there's more out there than we have time to focus on as an organization. And I, even deeper than that, I believe that, as I tried to say at the beginning, universities have a special role to play here. Um, there is a real threat to free expression, to access to information happening. And <clears throat> to the extent that the internet is connected to the university and is now under threat, cyberspace as a whole is, is being carved up in this way, um, universities should be a place that are raising the alarm bells and acting as custodians mm -hmm. of that space um, in line with the original vision of, of what the university in, in the ideal sense uh, represents. That won't take care of the entire problem. I mean, looking at this, it's a very, it's a big, difficult problem. And I don't think it's going to be solved with one kind of magic wand. Right. I think we have to think about it pragmatically, uh, approach it in, with a number of different solutions. Some of it would be government regulation. Some of it comes through public education. Um, some of it comes from the research that we're doing it. Some of it comes from technology as well. Um, and there's a lot that the big companies could do and, and actually are doing to give them credit to protect their users, Yeah. right? Um, if two-factor authentication were made mandatory, it would deal, right now at least, with a large proportion of the targeted espionage that we see out there because so, so much of it takes place through basic credential phishing. But the companies uh, are, are kind of waiting for each other to do it, and there's no one telling them to do it. And there's a big financial disincentive for them to do it, because as those of you know who do two-factor authentication, it is a bit annoying. You gotta get the text message or the other thing and kind of wait to log in before you go through that uh, procedure. But as I said, it would have if John Podesta had done that, maybe the election would be different. That's pretty significant. That's that's one of those what ifs. We do not want to go down that road, but that's that's a it's true. But okay, um, what I'd like to do is ask you to ask questions, and if you could identify yourself, and I think first right here, sir, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name's Angel Ione. Uh, thanks for your talk tonight. Thank you. Uh, quick comment. Yeah, I don't know if you're aware about our parliament house was hacked over the weekend. Yes, I saw that. Uh, so um, in terms of um, confidence in uh, the government to look after us is, takes another dive. Um, <laughs> what, what, what Anne was saying earlier about um, a sort of a city, citizens um, setting up in different countries to um, look into this, uh, I was just wondering, Ron, the technology and... Uh, set up uh, within your um, facility, is, is that something that could be uh, open sourced or made available and then some model for, you know, the universities, like you say, to be, be again, uh, the, the light in the, uh, in, in the cities? Mm -hmm. Thank you. It, uh, the answer is absolutely yes. And in fact, the, the whole approach to what we do is meant to be as open as possible. So we don't have... I was talking to James earlier, and he said, you know, what you're doing, it, it's kind of um, like you're um, not plagiarizing, but uh, adopting the methods of state intelligence agencies and kind of turning them on their head, um, which is true. We're watching the watchers using some of the techniques that they employ, 
The big difference is that there's no secrecy and we have no warranting, we have no classification. Uh, if you read a Citizen Lab report, you'll see that we actually go to great lengths to explain very clearly the methods and the tools and techniques we use. And with all of our reports, we put out as many indicators of compromise and other technical details. And we actually encourage other people to either challenge the research, show us maybe we made an error, um, which is the basis of the peer review uh, mechanism at the heart of what academics do, but also duplicate it. Take this in and go do it elsewhere, which is what I'd like to see happen more often. Mike, over here, please. And this might be not in your domain. Um, do you believe that there is um, electronic information out there about Khashoggi that just hasn't been tapped by the right people yet? In other words, the Turkish <coughs> government, Turkish intelligence? Yes, absolutely, that's the case. So after Omar Abdulaziz sent me the text message saying Khashoggi's disappeared, he also sent our researchers an image saying, uh, here's a picture, his fiance actually has his devices. So when he went into that uh, consulate, he left his devices with his fiance. And my hunch tells me that he's, his device was being monitored by one or more state actors, almost certainly Saudi Arabia. Um, then you have the evidence that came from Turkish intelligence um, concerning what went on inside the consulate. That either came from Turkey bugging the embassy, which would be a pretty big violation of diplomatic norms, but it, but it, it happens. happens all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or there is a theory that at one point, gruesome as it, this is, and I hate to even bring this up, but um, one of the Saudi intelligence chiefs back in Riyadh could have been monitoring the interrogation and the murder over a Skype uh, hangout, whatever it's called on Skype, I don't use it. Um, and if that's the case, then I'm certain that at the very least, uh, the signals intelligence agencies of the five eyes would have intercepted that and, and have that evidence. So a lot of groups were monitoring what's going on and there is a very big digital trail uh, as far as we could see, however, we could only verify that uh, I mentioned Omar in my presentation. I didn't mention that we also verified there are two other associates of Khashoggi's in the United Kingdom who also were being monitored by the Saudi operator using the Israeli technology. Three separate associates of Khashoggi were under surveillance and they're all communicating unaware that eavesdropping on the entire conversation with Saudi intelligence. Yeah. On this side, please, John. Uh, I am John Keane. Thank you, uh, Aim and, uh, and, and Ron, for your counterintelligence and your sense of humor and your commitment. The previous questioner almost stole my question. Uh, and I want to um, draw it out, draw you out a bit about whether and to what extent targeted digital espionage is, is, is riddled with a contradictoriness. So we, in the Khashoggi case, we now know, thanks to the New York Times and probably American intelligence, that Prince Salman is recorded as having said that he wants to kill Khashoggi. Um, there's a case where states are you know, in conflict with one another. Um, there's here the, the, the sort of Julian Assange principle they're not as clever as they think, and the system is not as seamless as it seems. Um, and we could add to this that in the corporate world, you know, Tim Cook gives a speech to the European Parliament and denounces Facebook and so on for, you know, data harvesting. And you, uh, <coughs> Citizen Lab um, folks, are doing that as well. You know, the system is penetrable. Mm -hmm. It's not seamless, mm -hmm. it seems, uh, and it's more contradictory than you gave the impression, mm. or am I just, you know, hoping against hope? What do you think about that contradictoriness of, of, of targeted digital surveillance? That's a really interesting way of, of describing what is a very messy world with uh, 
ultimately human beings and all that make up human beings undertaking activities and making decisions based on insecurities and greed and faulty information, partial information. When you finish with that, I think there is an important point. Yeah. If, if John's um, intimating that with the contradiction that it will collapse from its own contradictions, did I detect something like that? Or did you, was there a source of hope in that Wait. question? We wish. Okay. Well, listen, I, I'll pick up on one thing you, you said, which is, you know, you, you mentioned Citizen Lab. And one of the anxieties I have is that we're becoming the thing that we're monitoring. And, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not concerned about our values and the motivations behind what we do. I, I definitely, the, I, our group is among the most serious when it comes to taking ethics uh, seriously. However, in the course of doing what we're doing, we've had to continuously upgrade and amplify what we are doing in terms of our own digital security. And, and there are times when I'm thinking, what the hell, how did I get to this point where um, you know, I have to carry separate devices and take all sorts of precautions that I won't get into because this is being broadcast. Um, we have to be careful of who visits, and, and you know the, it's become the thing that we study. And so the, I, I think that's what you're kind of getting at, which is, I guess I'll say this, careful what you wish for. Because when I met James, he and I shared a common interest in state intelligence and surveillance. And my brilliant idea was, you know, you could create a counterintelligence based out of universities that would watch these powerful actors and look look where it's ended up. Um, that said, I do think the I, I still remain convinced the work is valuable, and and I I know that from um, the feedback that we get, especially in the human rights uh, world. Should we go up top? Um, why don't we make our way up top? We have this gentleman here, and then we'll work our way back. I saw your hand. We'll get up there. Thank yep. you. Uh, my name is Cosmos. Uh, six weeks ago, the Australian government passed legislation that that would compel people to have to decrypt, yeah. um, break encryption technology, basically. Um, at, at, at the same time, the Australian government is also um, uh, claiming that uh, technology from overseas, Huawei technology from China, is actually compromised, can't be used within 5G within Australia because it'll actually um, the, the support espionage. Um, it, it, to me, it's very much a case of democracy within Australia being hollowed out, as you put it, uh, yeah. where we're increasing surveillance of our own citizens, but we're then stopping other <coughs> nations that are seeking to conduct espionage in our soil. Just wondering if you have any comments you can say about that, uh, your, your views on, in, in terms of as a citizen of the country, yeah. and also in terms of the geopolitical risk, how that may change over the coming years when countries don't choose to buy our product because they all say, well, Australia is going to be yeah. spying on me. Yeah, the, the, you nicely pointed out the irony here of the situation. Uh, I definitely think that's bad policy. Um, it's not unique to Australia, of course. Uh, it's something that my own government, uh, in fact, uh, uh, policymakers in, in Canada routinely make the same argument. And um, it's, it's state agencies looking to gain some advantage um, at the same time that they're pointing at you know what they perceive to be agents of another government doing something like that. Um, it, it seems to me that we need to think through well, what is cybersecurity for? For whom and what? Uh, you know, right now the, the the discourse is really around securing governments. And I believe that we should be thinking about cybersecurity instead in terms of securing human rights, human beings, and citizens. And if you have that as your starting point, regardless of territorial borders, um, we'd be in a much better place. Conversation would be much simpler. Um, we'd have much more robust consumer level platforms that, that secure your information. Now, again, there's a contradiction here um, because we're living in a time where most of us engage in willingly, maybe not wittingly, but willingly, the greatest mass surveillance in human history through the surveillance capitalism business model that we voluntarily subscribe to. 
So we're all worried about what um, the Australian signals directorate might be picking up in our conversations, but yet we're not worried that Facebook is monitoring what you're typing in your message, but then deleting before you post it, watching your eyelids to see if you're excited by certain things and how long you linger on certain advertisements. I mean, we're complicit in this. And I think instead of, it's easy to point the fingers at, at the governments and say, oh, they're trying to pull one over on us. But we're doing this while we all carry in our pockets 24 hours a day devices that monitor us and everything we do, our thoughts, our habits. Um, I think we need to reckon with that as well. I'm going to go up top on this side, um, but while we're doing that, um, one of the most disturbing slides that Snowden leaked was some Apple um, higher-up employees saying, we're not worried about 1984 or Orwell. It's more like we were creating a mass cyber zombie army working for us. It was one of the worst, for me, scariest of the slides. Um, please. Was there, I saw a hand up on, right there, yeah. Hi, uh, Chris Dooley. Thank you for the uh, discussion. Assuming that this is not solved at an international level anytime soon, it seems that there is a sort of an evolving growth of varying institutions and policies and maybe resilient attitudes in different countries at different levels of maturity. Which country would you point to as the uh, best example that we can learn from at the moment? What, if there's a, is there one country we can point to that uh, has a, a good model of, you know, doing things right? Canada, of course. No, <laughs> <laughs> not by any means. Uh, <laughs> can I say something good about the U.S.? Yeah, that that's permitted. Good. Let's go do it. for it. I love the lively debates in the U.S. There's more fact-checking organizations there than anywhere else. The media is going for it yep. and funding other media organizations in developing countries. I think and, and, we, over, and oversight. Yeah, and I oversight. think you have, in spite of, you know, we could in all sit here. Everything. There is vigorous, yeah. robust oversight mechanisms that sometimes really. work. Yeah. So we, we're big fans of Donald Trump's USA. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> we're going to go there and then up top. You've been very patient, so we're making our way up there. Hi. USA. <laughs> USA. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Atif Khan. Very interesting talk. Definitely eye opening. Ron, my question is. Have you or other individuals at the Citizens Lab been attacked personally? Well, uh, it depends on what you mean by attacked, but um, there is right now um, a very interesting story that's unfolding that has been quite just came up disturbing for us. It's been over several months where um, several of our researchers were approached by individuals. Um, connect, contacting citizen lab researchers outside of their job having to do with personal interests. And after the first one, we became suspicious. In the second instance, we played along with it and actually set up a, a counter sting where we met with this person uh, in New York at a hotel and recorded the uh, conversation invited journalists from Associated Press along uh, to record this as well. Um, there are some details yet to be uh, surfaced, but it appears to us that this uh, was clearly an attempt to entrap us into saying something um, anti-Semitic in order to discredit our research, uh, principally about Israeli companies. Um, the reporting that came out today shows pretty definitively that the operatives who contacted us work for a company uh, called Black Cube that um, you may recognize because Harvey Weinstein hired this company to try to dig dirt on people who made allegations of, of sexual harassment and abuse against him. And also that company was involved in trying to dig dirt on Obama administration officials 
around the Iranian nuclear deal. Um, so I can tell you this is pretty uh, chilling uh, to have this happen. I think it's outrageous that this has gone on. Um, and I think it's a, if it's, this is happening to a group like Citizen Lab, it's a threat to academic freedom everywhere. And I really hope once uh, the full information comes out around this, that um, there will be some kind of statement of support from those of you who are academics. I'm not sure exactly how to organize this type of thing, but I really think this is something that uh, people in academia should stand up and condemn because uh, this is a chill on, on uh, academic freedom. It's also why we're very, very delighted, but also very um, wary of the chilling effect, as you put it, that to have this kind of open debate and dissidence required us for the first time ever to take security precautions. That's something that I find personally worrying. There's been a very patient gentleman up top. Please go for it. Thanks so much. Uh, I have a question. Uh, my name is Dominic, by the way. I have a question on an element of all this that you haven't really touched on yet. Uh, and it's related to the increasing number of very large databases of sensitive information. Um, in Australia, we have the My Health Record. You, you're familiar with that. Uh, so the concern is when they do get hacked and then cross-referenced with something like LinkedIn, uh, that it becomes basically a menu of, of points of vulnerability across the whole country, sort of a, a list of easy marks, so to speak. Um, can we avoid a future where, where blackmail is so easy that it's just all pervasive and commonplace? And if not, how can we rely on the integrity of any of our institutions? Um, is, so this, this is the concern that I have. Is, is that a legitimate concern, do you think? Is that a real concern? Or is that sort of something that we, you know, is safe and we shouldn't really worry about that? Well, I, I think it's a massive concern. I think we we're only at the beginning of what's going to become a, a hurricane of this sort of thing not only because uh, we have entrusted our data, uh, highly sensitive personal information to companies and organizations that as it turns out, have really not thought through digital security. It's an afterthought. Or they, if they have thought about it, they haven't done it very well. And it's just the nature of the ecosystem that we live in. There's so many points of failure. And so what we're seeing now, almost on a weekly basis, are mega breaches in the orders of hundreds of millions of people's accounts. And as you rightly point out, that information, when uh, correlated with other information that's out there, can provide a roadmap into a person's personal life or be used to um, extort them or target them. If they're high value target, having that information is very useful to get at somebody and trick them into doing something. I'm not entirely sure what to, to do about it. And I didn't even mention that, you know, there's this phenomenon of deep fakes now, that, which is using digital technologies to edit in such a way that it becomes very difficult to discern what's fake from real, putting people in compromising positions when they actually haven't done anything. You know, you, I think you put this very well, Aim. Everyone has, uh, it seems like, less and less time. We're all very busy. We're flooded with information. So when fake information is put out there, or tainted information is put out there like that, by the time someone uh, examines it, debunks it, it's already out in the public domain. It's done its damage. And, and that really concerns me. The only thing I can point to is I think we need to have a culture shift about how we treat personal data. And that's obviously going to be very difficult, and it won't happen even within a generation. I think we need to start thinking about data stewardship in the way we ought to be thinking about the natural environment. So um, as bad as things are with the environment, 20, 30 years ago, people wouldn't even have thought of recycling. Well, now recycling is pretty much habitual and normalized. And if you do things that are, you know, if you toss something, someone might call you out on it. I think we need a similar attitude around personal information, digital hygiene, being a bit more conservative about what we do online. And you, know, you see symptoms of that with the movements to disconnect from Facebook or unplug for a summer. I think that's very healthy. I think we need to explore that more. And that's the only way I believe that we'll correct this. But I do believe this is just the front edge of what is going to be a huge problem.
I think on that note, I would really like to another say... Another happy note. No, it's it's good note because it, I think what we've heard tonight is that you talked about counter-espionage, but counter-surveillance, but also awareness, not paranoia, but just awareness that we're constantly having our identities, um, if not stolen, certainly under surveillance and jeopardized by powers that aren't necessarily operating in our interest. And that's very important, I think, that, that message. And, but also to see that there's activist groups combining scholarship with real scientific acumen to provide the expertise. So I want to thank Aim and, and Ron for you know, not just telling us about that, but embodying it and doing it. So, and thank you all for coming out for this. So spread the word and come back again. We have other events on the same theme coming up over this uh, next month and, and the month following. So thank you uh, to you and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.